The Suffering is one of my personal favourite games of all time. The story of a brooding inmate whose escape from a monster infested island has him slog his way through mystical entities and psychological trauma. Daddy, help me daddy. Blasting monsters back to hell all the while battling his amnesia as he comes to term with his own gruesome abilities. It is such a good premise that really it deserves its own movie, which it did nearly get. It featured such a wealth of innovative concepts that it's hard to know where to start. So let's just start at the beginning. How many times have I done this and I still hate it? When you play the game for the first time, and yeah, it's different the second time round, but we'll come back to that later, you're introduced to a death row inmate named Talk as he arrives at Abbott State Penitentiary. Did you hear what this one did? I don't want to know, and you know what he I He beat his ex-wife to a bloody pulp, killed her with his fists. Look, I said I didn't- Then he drowned one son in the tub and threw the other out a window. Don't ask me to cry for him. Whew. Inmate, is this true? Oh, he won't say. Claims he blacked the whole thing out. <laughs> a likely story. Pretty dark stuff for the opening seconds of a game, but that's all you'll need to hear to know that clearly not is all what it seems with talk. A fast-firing narrative quickly sets the scene with the first of the game's many memorable support characters arguing about talk and his now infamous crime. Be quiet, you jerry curled fool. Don't you know who that is? While talk simply gazes at a photograph of his family. Just as you start to find yourself liking your cellmates, an ominous blackout strikes the facility. So, whoa! What the fuck is this? It's an earthquake! Fuck, what the hell's going on? The internet. CO, you gotta let us the out! Rapture. We're still humans, man! The whole we fucking got place is coming down! And in the darkness, a bloodbath ensues as seemingly supernatural entities emerge to make short work of the prisoners and guards alike. CO! What the hell's going on? As Talk makes his escape, the first of the game's enemies make an appearance. Torsos bound in bandages, with their head and limbs held aloft by metal contraptions. Hands and feet ending with deadly blades, on which they can scuttle about like spiders and dive forward in a spiral. These are known as slayers, and are an incarnation of all the poor souls who have died by decapitation through the island of Carnate's long, bloody history. Remember, likes or better yet, a subscribe is literally the currency that allows YouTube to pay me. So a little click from you is a massive win from me. Thank you so, so much. All right, back to the video. In fact, over the centuries, the island has been host to countless atrocities, including an act of racist genocide, a vicious prisoner of war camp, an insane asylum run by a slightly cliched but nevertheless extremely memorable sociopathic surgeon, and most recently, a penitentiary known far and wide for its efficient executions. In time, you discover that so much blood has been spilt on this small island that the very earth itself has become tainted from the evil deeds. And like something out of the Bible, it started to regurgitate this malignant energy, which then takes on the physical form of the various methods of death. And so begins Tork's lengthy journey across the island of Carnate, as he and the other survivors from the prison attempt to flee. You didn't lead the creatures in here, did you? <laughs> A fair bit of time is spent within the concrete walls of the penitentiary, but as the game progresses, it spans a number of memorable locations across the island, which reveal both rich and sordid pasts. Uncovered historical documents mixed with supernatural flashbacks would tell stories of bloodthirsty leaders and twisted lawmen. Position in quest, court martial. whose abuse of power laid the foundations for this mystical cataclysm that may or may not be linked to Tork's arrival. Some of the island's most notorious residents take on more lucid forms, such as a former executioner at Abbott State Penitentiary named Hermes T. Haight, who was known for his insistence on using the antiquated gas chamber. before eventually committing suicide in it, leading to a very dangerous gas-based humanoid that haunts and kills in the area 
and encourages you to do the same. He is weak. He should be killed. Or Horace P. Gage, who murdered his wife in a mad attempt to protect her forever. He ended up in the mercy chair, electrocuted by Abbott's then executioner, Hermes Haight. For years, inmates have said he haunts Abbott. And so is cursed to relive his electrocution for eternity. He's often seen being near electricity sources and begs for death from anybody willing and able. I've been waiting so long just to fucking sleep. I think you're my last chance, Talk. Don't let me down. Until Talk finally puts him out of his misery. Thank you. Up there! Unlike Hate the Executioner, Gage is actually remorseful and so encourages Talk to tread carefully and not succumb to the evil influence of the island. This place wants you, Talk. It needs people like you. Once it gets a hold of you, it won't let you go, like it hasn't let me go. And along with the voice of your wife, Your spirit's so good, T. Serves to encourage you to follow a more virtuous path. What's novel about the suffering is that these powerful creatures who run amok amongst the general population don't serve solely as they gain boss encounters, because their innate curiosity with talk results in them communicating with him periodically. You know there is no real escape. And more intriguingly, only talk appears to perceive these communications, with NPCs more often being confused by the event. These interactions help regress the mystery relating to Talk's past as they appear to possess a degree of supernatural insight that he doesn't have thanks to his amnesia. He needed to go. He wasn't interesting enough. Not like you. And none more so than Dr. Killjoy, the ex-overseer of the asylum. Well, well, well. Look what we have here. How long I have been waiting to encounter such a fascinating specimen. Who has a fondness for talk that seemingly doesn't extend to any of the hapless victims you witness him experimenting on. Lacerations to the body at strategic locations may put the patient into a state of shock, making him far more pliable, or at the very least, causing him to bleed to death, thus achieving the desired end. Beyond these enemies that exhibit personalities, Talk faces down a veritable army of spawned monsters, which include things like the Lumbering Marksman, which perhaps you can tell represents death by firing squad. <laughs> Lightly harking back to the Prisoner of War Camp days. that represent death by lethal injection. These monsters will generally attack anything in their path, including each other, which can be leveraged to your advantage if you're careful. The enemy variety is consistently novel. Like when you move through this huge quarry, digging creatures covered in chains burst out to attack you. Probably representative of the slaves that were used to mine. Or as you pass through an ages-old settlement, you'll encounter these innocent-looking Puritan girls who transform into disturbing infernos related to the three girls of the 1600s who made false witchcraft claims that led to the death of countless innocents. All of them are deliciously twisted and inspired, and all of them will go on to challenge your combat skills as much as they do talk sanity. And if you're wondering how Surreal produced such a mesmerizing collection of nightmarish creatures, then it's because they were conceptually drafted by the team in-house and then sent over to the Stan Winston Studios, who, if you didn't know, have a long list of Hollywood claims to fame, including the Predator, Alien Xenomorph, the Jurassic Park dinosaurs, and the creatures from The Thing, just to name a few. And so it's no surprise that with their oversight, the visual impact of the enemies are still some of the best seen in video game history. In fact, when this game was temporarily getting prepped for a movie adaptation by Midway and MTV Films, 
Stan Winston himself signed up. I've been a fan of comic books, action figures and games, science fiction, fantasy and horror films my whole life. I decided why not pull it all together and be a part of creating characters and creatures and monsters for video games. It made great sense to me to be a part of the creation of a really cool video game that will scare the out of you and to be a part of creating the creatures and the characters for that video game. So when I was approached by Midway about being involved with the suffering, it was a slam dunk, of course. Although sadly due to delays and then of course his tragic passing, it never came to be. I don't think so. My prisoners never make it out alive. Throughout the adventure, Talk will find himself in the company of various NPCs who all bring different elements to the table. <laughs> Where some exist merely to enhance the immersion and reinforce that you are navigating a working prison with hundreds of occupants. Brutal talk, brutal. Others can be relied upon to help you out or guide you through certain segments. Go on and get to the asylum and figure out what's causing all this interference. Those who do know Talk often comment that they're not surprised to see him alive. Man, if anybody could survive this shit, it figures you could. Prisoners, officers, and even a wise old escapee named Clem all offer their allegiance for a short time before fate pulls you apart. And some will allude to the history of the island, which you really don't want to miss if you can avoid it. Carnate Island's got a strange history, and Abbott is one fucked up who's gal. And let me tell you, we better stay away from the fucking basement. If things are bad up here, down there, it's gonna be like the mouth of hell. They do fight pretty well, but can also get killed if you let them get overwhelmed, and so keeping them alive becomes an exercise in narrative progression more than anything else. My family, if they're still there, it is too terrible to think of. The gameplay itself is very combat heavy, and while it's generally accepted by critics to be a survival horror game due to its morbid themes and construction, its method for providing scares relied on a broad range when compared to contemporaries, from the psychological PTSD-themed horror of the story through to the unsettling historical themes, creatures, and locations. It's too good for those fuckers! Let's get them alive! But despite its original approach to horror, it had absolutely no shame at all in hammering you with jump scares. <laughs> These might be as routine as a corpse getting thrown into your path, but other more inspired moments would include things like using the monitors to witness creatures running rampage around the prison. And just when you get comfortable with viewing these feeds from the safety of the control room, suddenly you realize that that mug who's about to get blindsided looks strikingly familiar. Oh, sh Graphically, it suffered from the same plain Jane environments commonly found in PS2 and Xbox era games, which was doubled down by a somewhat desaturated color palette indicative of a depressing prison complex on a rain-trodden island. But despite these limitations, it stood apart with the sheer volume of locations which we use to paint a memorable and engrossing world that has you move around the island a lot more than you'd expect by the end. Take aim! Fire! In an almost throwaway feature, first or third person could actually be selected on the fly, which as well as being a really impressive design feat. In practical terms, it would provide you the option to change up the pace of the game if you felt the need. Talk himself is the definition of a brooding badass. In a modern version of the game, it is unlikely he'd be silent, as really there's no reason for him to be beyond cost and design, but the fact that he navigates the entire ordeal without uttering a word does make him more menacing, as he constantly emits a sort of silent resolve. But that isn't the only thing that makes him menacing, because he has an unexplained and twisted connection to the island. He has a rage meter, and when it fills up, he transforms into something known only as the creature, taking on the form of a hulking monster with devastating physical power, not unlike the monsters haunting the island. As Talk doesn't speak, we don't know if he's shocked or even remembers it happening afterward. What we do know is that he is not your average prisoner. 
his arsenal of weapons ranges from a rusty blade ripped from a slayer through to a pair of magnum revolvers to a shotgun to a tommy gun appropriately discovered in an old war bunker and indeed anything heavier he can get his hands on. Despite his lack of outward personality, he is still a very memorable protagonist. If you're familiar with the box art, then I can tell you this much. That chump ain't talk. Talk will be back down the corridor kicking seven shades of monster shit out of whatever made this guy run away. Before long, the enigmatic Dr. Killjoy assigns himself the role of your spirit guide. And so, my favorite subject arrives. It is in this room that all the secrets will be revealed. Making periodic appearances with the goal of curing you of your condition. The finer details of which he keeps to himself until far later in the game. At times he hinders you in order to analyze your actions, and other times he assists you, but despite being as twisted and undeniably sociopathic as the other spirits that haunt the island, you would likely struggle to progress without him. As he and the other spirits lead you toward the game's cinematic conclusion, Dr. Killjoy continues to encourage you to dig deep in your memories and figure out the truth on your own. And while it might seem like a simple reveal on paper, it's actually quite profound once you're buried hours into the game and have the blindfold lifted. Spoiler time, skip the next segment if you plan on playing the game, you've been warned. So when you get angry, you bring forth the creature. As a gameplay mechanic, it is super gratifying to use and absolutely nothing stands in your way with boss creatures pretty much meeting their match once you start swinging, and standard enemies practically getting vaporized as you tear through them. For the majority of the game, you'll find yourself thinking, okay, clearly talk must be linked to these creatures somehow, which might have explained why the events kicked off shortly after his arrival. Well, no, actually. You see, the central plot that revolves around whether or not Torque killed his family is tied to your actions. Are you mad again? This is why Dr. Killjoy fails to reveal the truth early on, because he, and indeed the game, first need to gauge your choices, which determines if you are indeed a psycho who likes to murder fellow inmates and guards, or simply an innocent man who's just trying to escape, working with whoever he can along the way. These paths determine the ending, which retrospectively assigns a fate to your family, making it so that either you did murder them or you were framed, or something kind of depressing somewhere in the middle if you like kill a few people by mistake, but not everybody, but screw that ending, no one cares. Either way, when Killjoy ambushes you with his minions, which forces you to bring forth the creature, what he is actually doing is intentionally aggravating you to the point of exploding into a rage, and then watching how you react at your lowest moment in the hopes that you will see the creature for what it really is. The escapee Clem has a diary that can be recovered in parts and his entry perhaps says it best. The creature. I saw this creature in a dream and it seems somehow connected to these horrific events. In my dream, I witnessed the inmate Torque transform into this beast and lay waste to all around him. Since the cataclysm, I have seen Torf go berserk, killing beasts with his bare hands. But of course, during such times, he himself does not actually transform into a beast. He merely becomes intensely enraged. The meaning of my dream, I leave for the reader to discern. So there is no creature, just Torf going berserk, and ripping his enemies limb from limb, and tearing chunks out of them with his teeth. In his mind's eye, he sees himself as a feral beast, and so that's what we see. But then he blanks out the memories because he lives in denial. It really helps dissipate some of the underlying tension when you realize that it's not you who's trapped on the island with these monsters, but rather it's them who are trapped here with you. I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. From here, you will then realize that the game has been full of moments where what you thought you saw no longer matches up with the most likely reality because only Talk sees the creature. For example, if you rewatch the footage from the very start of the game when Talk first escapes his cell, we realize that it was in fact the creature who thundered past and knocked his cell door off, alluding to the fact that maybe Talk just ripped it free in a moment of adrenaline-fueled panic. We don't know. 
End of the line. And once you've completed the game and played a second time, you are treated to a very unexpected treat. The game starts an hour or two earlier, and you find out why it is that the guards are so tense as they walk talk to his cell. This was actually cut from an earlier draft as they realized that the creature couldn't be introduced this early without making it obvious that nobody else can see it. And so instead they managed to keep the scene in, but in a very innovative way. I say we do it now. I'm in. Hell yeah, let's do this shit. Look alive, shit's going down. <laughs> Damn it! Damn it! Make it quick. Drop your weapons, inmate. You didn't have any weapons. I'm begging you. I got a family. Shit! What are we gonna do with them? Not much we can do. Man's already going to death row. One of the most important aspects to reinforce about the suffering is that it wasn't simply a game split up into levels. It played out more like a cinematic journey that did a great job of breaking up the play cycle simply by having you traverse through eerie and memorable locations while immersing you in an intriguing storyline, including bricked up wartime bunkers beneath the prison, a stretch of beach where you help Clem make his break for freedom on a raft, a deserted insane asylum where you meet the friendly stoned guard, old mines once populated by slaves, abandoned homesteads, quarries, various sections of the actual penitentiary, and so much more. It wasn't obvious at all where you were going or where it would all end, and the various characters you met along your journey from charismatic inmates to wary COs to supernatural entities whose motivations were far from clear, it was a thrilling and consistently fresh ride all the way through. When you downed the final boss, depending on how many other survivors you either killed or saved, three very different endings would occur. First is one in which Talk did in fact kill his family. A boatman arrives and Talk kills him running back onto the island. I think it's safe to say that this is not canon or else that would be the end of the suffering. The second is a mixed bag where he killed his wife by accident and his eldest son took both he and his brother's life in anguish. Or the best ending, in which criminals broke into your home, killed your family and set you up, which is considered the good ending and the only one I was aware of when I played it as a kid. The fact is, this is supposed to be the true ending, one in which Tork is suffering from tremendous PTSD over the death of his family, and fearing that it was his inner demon that was responsible, he continues to feed it by believing in it until it actually manifests in the most devastating of ways. I heard about you in the news. I got a friend at the DA's office who says the prosecutor on your case is being indicted. He says you probably get a new trial. And so, the mystery of your family solved and talk due to have his case reopened, you successfully make it off the island with your morality intact, which felt like a well-deserved cinematic conclusion to this man's night spent in hell. Love always, Carmen. And then, just a year later, a sequel arrived called The Ties That Bind. God, I still remember my excitement when I received it as a birthday present, and I remember firing it up and just being taken aback by the extent of the graphical improvements that had been made in just a few months. A heap more weapons were introduced, plus a two-gun limit to keep the action flowing, and your trademark Zombium health pills could no longer be carried around, which made health pickups progress-based, both of which heavily shifted the controls toward the infamous Halo gameplay model, which was absolutely peaking at the time, with Halo 2 having been released alongside the first suffering the previous year. This changing of gears to match Halo's pace marked a clear shift away from this survival horror and toward full-fledged action. The story has a quick prologue that introduces us to Blackmore, a prisoner who apparently is a step up the food chain from Talk, within seconds shattering the illusion of Talk being pretty much untouchable, which they had done such a good job of establishing just the previous year. Following this, an event occurs in which Talk comes across the exact same creatures at another prison way before he actually arrived at Carnate Island, and then the timeline moves back to the present day where it picks up minutes after the first came with Talk quickly meeting some kind of cliched paramilitary organization who are not only aware of the incident, but they're actually preparing to face it in and around Baltimore, which is both Talk's hometown and conveniently the closest place from the island. 
So this has now shattered the second illusion that Carnate Island itself was supposed to be ground zero for this catastrophe because of all of its exposure to the worst of humanity's crimes. Nope, straight off the bat, that is officially branded bullshit and this can apparently happen anywhere. And everybody's seen it as well, so the cat is definitely out of the bag, making this on paper seem more like an apocalypse than a contained supernatural incident. Of course, that aspect of the story isn't expanded on because, well, the story's shit. The explanations remain woefully vague and do little to enhance the story beyond souring the awesome concept from the first. Carnate Island oozed atmosphere because the isolated nature of your tale drove home the concept that you were alone and help was not coming, which is a definitive survival horror concept. But ties that bind just didn't care, proving that it was more of an action game than a horror in the long run. Instead of focusing on the why in relation to the supernatural events, and spoiler alert if you plan on playing then skip this because I am not holding back, the game largely focuses on talk and Blackmore and their shared history in Baltimore. I have to give Surreal Software credit in that they clearly tried to develop an exciting and twisting tale for talk that was worthy of a sequel, with the barrel-chested Michael Clark Duncan voicing Blackmore. And what's the little lady going to say now? As he taunts your progression around the city, your wife and kids still speaking to you from the grave. Now, Blackmore is supposedly a kingpin of the highest order. Blackmore has been funding the foundation for years a gun-running, drug-smuggling, people-trafficking sociopath that very few people have ever seen and lived to tell the tale. But oh boy, does he love to pop up in Talk's life in a time when most people would probably be running for the hills, because, you know, it's the freaking apocalypse. Let me out, please! And then, eventually, the mighty twist is revealed that, in fact, there is no Blackmore. I can't believe this we discover that Talk and Blackmore are one and the same. Awesome, right? Killer twist! Two sides of Talk's mind trying to take control. Except, tragically, it's not. It is the stupidest plot hole filled insanity that you could possibly come up with. It just makes no sense if you have an IQ above 35. I'm serious, it's a problem. If Talk is Blackmore, why are Blackmore's men trying to kill you throughout? Why did Blackmore have his goons attack you in prison other than for dramatic effect? Why is he in prison? Why isn't he bothered about escaping from the city when monsters are running amok? Why would anybody still be running a crime organization when the streets of Baltimore are like this? And if Talk had a wife and kids, which he did, and then transitioned almost immediately after their deaths to a life behind bars, which <laughs> he did, how was Blackmore supposed to have built up an entire criminal empire from the shadows without talk even noticing? It's like they took the best bit of Fight Club, which had been released just a few years earlier, and then had absolutely no idea how to intelligently implement it into the story. And so they just shoehorned in the twist at the end and like hoped nobody would notice the gaping plot holes. You just have to live with them. And I'm not even done yet because for all the stupid of the story, one gaping change took the front row. The twist meant that regardless of which ending you received in the first game, which ironically could be imported into the ties that bind for consistency, it would transpire that it was indeed Blackmore who was responsible for killing your family whatever happens. Your actions simply define whether he took over talk and killed them with his bare hands, which is obviously the original bad ending. Nobody would ever say that you! Oh my yes. Blood, blood everywhere. But can you read the writing on the wall? Or if he hired goons who then overstepped their orders and apparently upset him, which of course is the good ending. Now they're gone! I don't think I could have ever done it. But it was the wrong kind we associated with. But either way, Tor killed his family. Talk sucks. Hold it right there! Why the Blackmore side would then frame the Talk side to spend life behind bars if he's a rising kingpin is anybody's guess, but you better believe is never explained. It was one mighty nail in Talk's coffin, completely stripping him down from the stoic survivor he was in the iconic first game and building him back up as basically a broken family murdering lunatic. All for some pseudo thriller plot twist that just wasn't worth it. You might even applaud the attempt if it didn't do such a thorough job of performing a crippling character assassination on Talk, which completely undoes the story, choices made, and any significance of the original. 
but as well as diluting the relevance of Carne Island, which transpired to be as significant as Tork himself when it came to the atmosphere and the mythos of the game. Oh yeah, and the black-clad soldiers which alluded to a larger involvement are pretty much left by the wayside, as well as their mission which is never expanded upon. And so the game's conclusion only gives us a resolution to the Blackmore Talk Saga, in which, unsurprisingly, you beat him in your mind and he gives up the ghost. Boom. Pun intended, that one was good. I couldn't get you to break the rules, and the way I play, it's all or nothing. All in all, the suffering may be dated, but it's still a gem that boasts originality, immersion, and some genuinely thrilling action. It is still very playable. And as I am cursed with an IQ higher than 35, like most fans of the suffering, I like to pretend that the ties that bind simply doesn't exist at all. And that was the end of the suffering. Thank you.